Welcome to the uh, Lockstep Remote Zoom webinar. Um, we appreciate all of you joining. My name is Charlie Van Pelt. I have responsibility for uh, sales at Lockstep. We are partnered with uh, Smith and Howard and Trusted Council to give you this uh, webinar remotely. So we appreciate you joining. Um, hopefully, we'll um, be able to uh, have the experience remote be uh, as good as what we had in person. We've, we're doing a series of these events. We had one that was sold out last month in Alpharetta, and we wanted to continue that today. And uh, in the world that we now live in, we made a decision a few weeks ago, obviously, to, uh, we actually made the decision before we were told 50 or less, and then we were told 10 or less people um, so we decided to be responsible and, and move it to um, a remote meeting. So we appreciate you joining. Um, uh, we've got some good information. Um, first off, I'd like to introduce Lockstep, uh, and then I'm going to introduce each of the speakers, and then we'll get right into the content of the, uh, of the presentation here. So um, when we did this last time, uh, one of the feedback you know, we want to continue to get feedback, and we hope that you guys will give us that. Also, one of the feedback uh, advice that we got last time was that we should explain a little bit who Lockstep is ahead of time, so you guys know our credentials and why we're having this um, webinar and the information that you're getting. So, I want to do that quickly, and then I'm going to introduce each of the speakers, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Jeff Brown to uh, do the first presentation. So, um, Lockstep, we've been around 12 years now. We are a secure managed IT company. Uh, we have headquarters in Duluth, Georgia. We have another office in, in Kennesaw. Uh, we're actually moving to a new space in the Peachtree Corner area later on this year. Um, and we've been around, like I said, 12 years. We are a very engineering oriented, very technical uh, organization. Uh, we were founded by engineers uh, as a, as a, IT consulting firm uh, that was a pure play IT consulting firm for a while. And then we ended up selling products and then we developed an entire managed uh, IT type practice. And we've also developed a security practice as, as well as part of that. So um, we started solving problems. We have a lot of uh, schools. We have a lot of corporate accounts and what we've really become in those situations are trusted advisors to our customers. And a lot of you on here are our customers, you know that. A lot of you don't know us and, and you know, that's what our introduction to you is that we do tend to uh, get on the side of the table with our customers and partner with you to provide the best solutions for you and to look after you there. Uh, we have a wide range of products and services that, that we offer. I mean, we are, we, we have expertise around networking and Wi-Fi, uh, storage and virtualization, firewall security, uh, cloud, uh, virtual desktops. We have an array of options. You know, we can do backup as a service, patching as a service. We can do hosted infrastructure, manage IT, security as a service. Uh, we have an analytics and data practice. I mean, one of the things that we try and do is offer some higher level services, not just help desk for you, but you know, around the higher end security, analytics, user experience that some of you on here now are looking at. So um, we have wide range of clients. We've been in business, like I said, for 12 years now, we continue to grow. One of the principal areas that we have is our security practice. Uh, we have uh, a group of CISSPs on staff uh, and we are very much involved in all aspects of security and where we don't have expertise, we partner with people like Smith and Howard and with the with trusted council as well. So that being said, I'd like to go ahead and introduce and let you know what we're gonna have this morning. Again, we appreciate your time. Um, we were gonna do this over a breakfast meeting in the perimeter area and serve you breakfast. We can't do that remote. Um, so hopefully we'll give you good content and uh, you can enjoy it at, at home or wherever you are. So, all right, so we're gonna have three speakers today uh, and then we're gonna have a, um, uh, a, a quick interview on a uh, customer who's been through the same process. Our first speaker is Jeff Brown. He's the senior business advisor for Smith & Howard. Smith & Howard is an Atlanta-based CPA and advisor firm. 
Uh, Jeff joined in 2019 and specializes in directing and guiding organizations to achieve financial success and also to mitigate risk. Um, he's been in the security business about 18 years and, and helped customers with their security and risk challenges. Originally from Western Canada, um, Jeff has spent more than 30 years building, supporting, and selling technology, software, and solutions in the U.S., again, around security and vulnerability. So Jeff will be our first speaker. Um, our second speaker will be Jonathan Kyle. Jonathan is the security practice lead for Lockstep Technology Group. Um, here's his qualifications. And, you know, they send me these things where we, where we read bios. I will tell you that uh, Jonathan's bio starts off as, first, he's a hacker. So um, he's very much involved in the security thing in the security space. Here are his industry certifications and educations. He has a Master of Science in Cybersecurity. He's a CISSP. He's a Certified Penetration Testing Engineer, CPTE. He's a Certified Professional Ethical Hacker, CPEH, ISO 27001, and CISSO. Uh, Jonathan came from, uh, his experience includes active duty military. He was a captain in the U.S. Army. Uh, counterintelligence, combat operations, military, network management, operates with both the CIA and NSA, and he was a CISO at a mid-sized auto manufacturer. Um, basically, uh, Jonathan's the one we go in and we scare people with because he will uh, really expose a lot of things which should make you nervous about your security. And then our final speaker is going to be Michael uh, Jones from Trusted Council. Uh, which is a corporate and intellectual property law firm here in Atlanta. Uh, he's going to discuss data privacy, compliance, and licensing. Um, and Michael has a strong background in intellectual property and business-oriented technology. Uh, he handles licensing and commercial agreement issues, advises clients on IP and technology licensing, outsourcing, and service agreements. Uh, he's responsible for negotiating complex technology transactions involving software licensing, data analytics services, cloud hosting services, R&D, data privacy, and data security. Um, he's spearheading Trusted Council's initiative to help clients understand and comply with the European Union's DD GDPR and other recent privacy developments. Um, and he's been 14 years in the legal profession. Um, uh, most recently, he was the Associate General Counsel in the Technology, Intellectual Property, and Strategic Sourcing Group at New York Life Insurance, and uh, he graduated from Emory. This is, this is always interesting to me, with a, a Bachelor of Arts in Classics in French, followed by a Master of Arts degree in Classical Philology, as well as a Master of Philosophy and Doctor of Philosophy degrees from Yale University. He then earned his JD from Emory University. So he's quite learned. So you got, those are your three main speakers today. We also are gonna have a quick conversation with Neil Freeman. He's the Director of Business Development at Pro Tiles. Uh, and he's gonna discuss along with our own Derek Davis, uh, one of our pre-sales engineers here, lessons learned from a ransomware uh, situation that they had there. So we're gonna have an a interview and discussion on that as well. All right, so without further ado, we again thank you for joining us and look forward to a good session. I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and let Jeff uh, take the lead here and go ahead and uh, I think you should have control, Jeff. I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Jeff is still showing mute on your uh, system there. There you go. Better? Better. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Okay. I have, I've controlled that. Let's see. There we go. Thank you, Charlie. And, um, as, as, uh, Charlie mentioned, I'm with Smith & Howard. Uh, Smith & Howard is uh, a company that's been around for 49 years. Next year will be our 50th year. Uh, we're a nationally 
recognized accounting and advisory firm here in Atlanta. On that, I, I lead the, 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 the risk advisory practice uh, to uh, help, our people, uh, help our customers understand kind of what the, the impact is on, on risks that are hitting their business. And one of the things you might be asking is why we're going to talk about risk in, as far as ransomware. Um, and, and one of the key aspects is, is that managing risk is one of the key responsibilities of business leaders in all organizations. Um, they've got to make decisions day to day on whether or not uh, to, you know, to evaluate their risks um, and to make decisions on whether they're prepared to accept that risk, mitigate or transfer those risks. But it's really difficult to do if they don't understand the financial impact of each risk. So prior, you know, prior to a situation with ransomware or even a pandemic issue like we've got right now, these are both business continuity uh, risks that you've got to deal with. You've got to deal with differently. And some of the biggest challenges that organizations have is you see, you've seen a lot of the numbers that come out on costs of ransomware and the average costs and the rest of that. But the reality is, is that those risks to from whether or not it's ransomware or anything else are different within each organization as far as what the financial impact is. So it's really important to be able to assess that. Um, I'm not going to got to delve into the numbers. You, everybody's seen these for the last close to 10 years, uh, what the average breach is uh, in that, you know, there are plenty of justifications of understanding why we need to do more. Uh, to protect uh, sensitive data and our customers' information uh, on that. But understanding kind of how that impacts the organizations is a critical component. Journal. Uh, Whoops. I'm having a little trouble with the slides here. There we go. So when we're talking about risk, we're really talking about putting together a governance risk and compliance strategy for your organization. And that is more of a, a foundational type of, of approach. A lot of companies just kind of figure, well, I'm just going to put some security controls in place and I'm, I'm ready to go. And what we're seeing is it's important for different pieces of your company and, 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 and different uh, individuals that have different uh, responsibilities about the, the layers and what needs to be in place. The, the foundation of this is your security program. And obviously that's critical for to protecting uh, sensitive information. Um, those, you know, really focus on kind of what the threats and identifying the threats and vulnerabilities that are currently exist and how, how to protect against those. Your security officer is ultimately responsible for that. Um, we do offer certification and, 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 and services around some of these, some of those programs uh, that, but it's critical that you have that. Um, the, the, the second layer of uh, your, your, your GRC strategy is, is really your compliance aspect. These are contractual obligations your firm has entered into, as well as regulatory requirements that, that you're, uh, ha you have to do. Uh, and and uh, you know, whether you can think of those as like uh, a, a SOC 2 AUTA, PCI, HIPAA, high trust, uh, or privacy aspects, as we mentioned before, like GDPR and CCPA. Um, you know, the, typically the compliance officer and the compliance officer, you know, these are different roles, but maybe the same person between compliance and security. Most organizations have separate person for this. Uh, really what they're focused on is the non-compliance controls and ensuring that <clears throat> they do what they need to do to make sure that they're um, complying with the obligations and they're not risking um, violating their, their, their contractual agreements with their customers and, and, and partners. So on that, um, the, the, what sits on top of that really is your, your risk program. Um, 
And, and that really takes all of the information from your security program, such as the security threats and vulnerabilities, and adds in the non-compliance uh, control issues from your compliance programs and a able to uh, really uh, take that, put it into, uh, uh, com combine that to create a risk registry as well as we do uh, uh, cre create an asset registry as well on that. Um, we combine that and then combine with uh, a lot of metrics and measures to be able to calculate what the financial impact is for each individual risk and as well um, what the mitigation costs. This gives the uh, executives, the CEO, the CFO, the board, the information that they need in terms that they understand to be able to prioritize um, uh, what, you know, where the, whether or not they should, uh, they can absorb this risk or whether or not they should need to mitigate it based on those costs or if there's a possibility of transferring that to a third party or to cyber insurance. So it's again, a critical component that really organizations need to, to build out all three of these layers in order to be efficient and be able to provide their executives the information that they're looking for. Now, a lot of folks say, well, yeah, we already do risk assessments. Well, not all risk assessments are, are equal. Um, there's a, dif a difference between what they call qualitative and quantitative risk assessments. Um, if you look at what people typically use as a risk assessment, they'll go into standards such as like the NIST 830 or an ISO standard. And really from these ones, you get a, <clears throat> excuse me, a report that uh, the, uh, that comes out that lists in uh, highs, mediums, and low risks for that. It, it uh, and uh, you know, well, you can see it as red, yellow, green as well. Um, this is really useful information for your security officers and for your CIO to be able to prioritize activities within um, the, the IT infrastructure. Uh, unfortunately, um, that that information doesn't translate well to the CFO and the CEO who pretty much think in terms of dollars when we talk about financial impact um, on that. So um, the, the challenge is, 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 is not so much that the information is not useful. It's, it's just it isn't as granular and impactful. And uh, that's why the quantitative approach becomes more effective when we're dealing with getting information to the executives when we, Use, uh, we use a quantitative risk analysis process. We deliver what's called, you know, the, the financial impact in terms of dollars. And then they've got the, really the tools that they need to be able to prioritize that risk and determine where their risk thresholds are and uh, what, what, what the actions they need to take. In our process, what we do is we be able to, we, when we define financial impact, it comes down to where you're taking, you're calculating out the likelihood of that uh, event happening, as well as the potential value of of, uh, of the assets that are that are uh, you know, exposed, and, and and that really helps you create create that number, that risk number. So um, it's. Uh, not magic. It's not a black box. It, this is this is very uh, you know again uh, laid out from a mathematical standpoint to be able to provide uh, you know numbers that that uh, that your leadership can use. So how the how this happens is 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 one is, is as I mentioned as we take those risk factors, the threats, the imp the implications to the business the common issues. We put those through metrics and measures. Uh, we, look, we also combine it with the internal and external audit information in, in any non-compliant areas and come up with uh, both the, 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 the numbers, but we also present it in a form that um, executives and, and business leaders can, can understand. This graphics is a representative of kind of one of the ways that we present this information. 
Uh, and this example actually goes more than just IT and, and, and that it actually extends across the organization. So you'll see that we've identified risks in various different departments within the, within the company. Uh, as, a, as a heat map comes up, you'll notice that, you know, they've got within the red, there are actually three, um, three high risk uh, uh, scenarios in, in, from the legal and regulatory place. You know, so leaders can start to, to look at this and be able to prioritize, okay, we need to look at this. We understand what the, what the financial impact is. We understand what the mitigation cost is and say, is this something that we've got to put on the list to do right away? Or is this something we can push off for a while? Or is there another approach that we need to take? <coughs> Excuse me. So going through this process helps organizations understand, you know, again, the financial impact specifically, oops, uh, of, uh, of, of the uh, of specific breaches like ransomware um, on that and what it's going to do to your organization uh, with respect to, uh, you know, all the different types of aspects of those threats and what the costs are going to be to mitigate those threats. Uh, it allows you, uh, the, the leaders, to, to, to prioritize. And, and more importantly, though, it helps them determine kind of what kind of risk appetite do they really need in the organization and where and how they could go ahead and transfer some of that risk onto cyber insurance or third parties. Um, again, it, if it all comes down to visibility uh, and, and, and in their ability to, to make decision, make the right decisions uh, you know, prior to events like this happening. And from there, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Jonathan. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Jonathan Kyle. Uh, just like Charlie said, I'm the security practice manager for, for Lockstep Technology Group. Um, go to the next slide here. So, so this first slide we've got here um, is really kind of a transition between uh, Jeff's piece and, and my piece here. So understanding risks to your organizations, what level of risk uh, does ransomware pose to your organization? So Specifically here, what we're looking at, um, some of the things we're going to talk about here, what is the easiest thing to hack humans? We'll get into that here in just a minute. But uh, So ransomware is estimated to have a global damage uh, costing organizations $11.5 billion in 2019, uh, with 12.1 days as the average downtime from a ransomware attack. So I want to kind of put that into perspective a little bit. So um, in, in levels of risk to your organization, um, you know, the, the FBI's section for Internet Crime Computing Consortium, IC3, is their section that takes in Internet crime complaints and kind of plots the amount of data they see um, to, to kind of show the global or the U.S. effect of cybercrime. Their current estimate is that around 10 to 13 percent of cybercrime is actually reported. So uh, the numbers here that you're seeing, this 11.5 billion, the 12.1 days of downtime, that's of reported numbers. Um, and if, if only, if they're correct in their estimation, which is around 10 to 13% of crime being reported, um, ransomware specifically should be way up in that top right corner of, uh, of risk for the organizations. Um, and specifically with the, the, the way that times are changing right now, specifically with how, um, how we're moving to a completely uh, computer remote based uh, working system. Um, frankly, we're, we're living in a hacker's paradise right now uh, because every business completely depends on, on computers and networking operational capacity in order to, to operate at all. Um, so we're kind of moving into a section where ransomware, uh, you know, this year we've seen around a 400-ish percent increase in ransomware. Um, and if, if this continues right now, uh, you may even be able to add a digit to that number. Um, ransomware is not going anywhere but up. And we're going to kind of discuss why those things are, are happening. So the first thing uh, I want to mention here is, you know, if you have questions throughout this, um, you're welcome to uh, put them in the chat and we can kind of deal with those on the, the back end. We're going to have a question and answer session uh, and you're welcome to answer or ask questions and we'll try to answer them at the end. Um, the first thing we want to cover is, is how does ransomware work? 
Um, so there's, there's several pieces here that you can see in the chain of events in ransomware. So there's, just, there's generally two ways that ransomware originally spreads, and that's either through some form of user interaction, which is, you know, you see there spam attachment, and we're going to kind of talk about that in a second. And then the other, the other primary method that it uses for initial infection is an exploit kit. So we're going to kind of talk about those two briefly. Uh, the first would be either through a phishing email or a drive-by download on an infected website or, you know, uh, an infected document that you can create. Um, so those are, you know, generally methods where you're tricking the user into performing some form of action that they shouldn't perform. Uh, that's through some form of social engineering, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit uh, here later. But that's usually the most common method that you see is that. Uh, where you're going to be tricking the user into either clicking on a link or opening an attachment or providing credentials even. Um, it could be as simple as that. Uh, and that's the, the first method. So the second method there is, is some form of exploit kit. An exploit kit is a, an initial vulnerability in a system or application that ransomware is going to use to infect the, the, the first system, the patient zero, if you will, of your ransomware infection. Um, and those are going to be things um, specifically like uh, remote code executable vulnerabilities. Um, you saw this with WannaCry. WannaCry was the first really, really bad remote code executable um, ransomware where it used the Eternal Blue exploit that was uh, developed by certain organization. Uh, and that particular vulnerability required no user interaction at all. Uh, you could remotely get system uh, or NT system, uh, basically, is, is, is what it boiled down to, over the server message block um, vulnerability that existed in the Windows 7 and 2012 operating system, server 2012 and Windows 7 operating systems. And um, at the time that that came out, um, so Eternal Blue comes out in March of 2017, um, and two weeks later, Windows publishes a, a patch for that vulnerability. And then two months later in May is when the actual WannaCry ransomware spread around the world. Uh, and again, that didn't require user interaction to make that work. So as soon as you have the initial infection, uh, the ransomware can perform many different actions. There's, there's many, many different strains of this right now. There's about 10-ish that are on the top of the list, like Robin Hood, Sedinokopi, um, Ryuk. There's several different ransomwares that are in the top of the list right now, and all of them operate differently, but they have very similar um, core, if you will. So after, after ransomware infects its initial victim, things it's going to do are look for... Uh, look for credentials. What credentials do I have on the current system? Uh, what permissions do I have to touch what files? What other systems can I reach? Um, it's going to attempt to call back to its command and control server, which is, you know, uh, going to basically tell the payload to execute or to not. Um, and then, you know, what it's going to do is attempt to encrypt or copy files or exfiltrate files even. That's a new thing. Um, and then see if it can spread from there to other systems and users. So once it does that, uh, it, and it infects as many systems as possible, it's generally going to lock out the computer itself or lock the files on the computer and allow users to log in, and you'll get some form of ransom message. That can either come in a, a pop-up screen on your actual system, or it can be when you click on one of the, the locked files. It's, just, it's different for each one, but generally you'll get a ransom message from the attackers that'll state, here's what's occurred, we've infected your systems, this is the kind of encryption we're using, there's no way to get it back except to pay us. Um, and then basically that'll demand the ransom. And generally that's in some form of cryptocurrency they're wanting, Bitcoin's a popular one, but there's also others that they'll require as well. And then there will be instructions on how to create a Bitcoin wallet and to, to pay them. So, you know, the question here is if, if businesses don't change, do you think ransomware will increase or decrease? Well, let me say, as in the world has now changed, and like I said earlier, as we've moved into a, a world where computing basically is the business right now, the internet and uh, computers are, are how businesses are staying alive at this period, do you think that the bad guys will stop trying to demand ransom uh, because we're in hard times? Let me guarantee you, no. Um, they don't care. Uh, most of this will probably increase because they understand that your amount of risk to your business has increased because of uh, your, your dependence on those things now. 
And because of that dependence, their likelihood for success is going to increase. So let me suggest that no, uh, it is going to get much worse. So I just wanted to paint a picture here about uh, where this has really come from. So, you know, ransomware has been around for a while. The first ransomware was in 1989 with the AIDS Trojan, which is a really interesting story if you ever want to look that up. But um, it's, you know, it kind of never was really a thing. It started a little bit more in the 2000s, but then around 2014, it picked up like crazy, dropped off again um, as more people were just succumbing to, you know, the ransom and choosing to not pay it. Then uh, about two years ago, uh, people started paying ransoms like crazy. So we saw a drastic increase in the percentage of ransomware that came back really hard. So Gan Crab, uh, which is probably a Eastern European misspelling uh, for Grand Crab, is a ransomware strain uh, that's kind of a success story in this, in this business world. So uh, this, what I've got posted here, is their retirement note that they posted in Nightmare Market, which is a pretty common uh, dark web forum. Um, and this is them basically stating that, well, you know, they've claimed that they've earned more than $2 billion in business. Now, this was in, uh, you know, this was around, I believe, May of 2019 that they retired. Um, they originally launched their first version of their ransomware in 2017. And uh, the first version failed. Uh, their, their C2 server didn't have good security and one of the good guys broke it and then released all the decryption codes. So they went back to the drawing board and created GANCRAB version 2.0 with, with much better security. And then in that year and a half, two years, they claim to have cleared over $2 billion in business. And now they're going to retire and be happy wherever they are. Um, that is a ridiculous amount of profit for the amount of time and effort and the number, the amount of risk that is, that's involved in doing this business. So if this is the case, do you think this business model is going to increase or decrease? It is most definitely going to increase. If we don't do something to stop this, then it will most definitely increase. So what I wanna talk about is what do we do to stop this? Um, so ransomware works because we don't do simple things. Um, there, if, what if I told you that we could stop 80-ish percent of ransomware by just doing a few things? And I kind of wanted to talk about what those few things are in order to get rid of the vast majority of them. It's not going to get rid of everything. There is no such thing as a silver bullet, but you can do a lot to reduce your risk uh, from ransomware if you do some simple things. So first thing I want to talk about in this quadrant is training people. Uh, you know, what we talked about earlier, the vast majority of these ransomware, um, they, they use some form of social engineering to get a user to do something that they're not supposed to do. Um, so that's generally a phishing email. That's generally a drive-by download of an affected website. That's a, it's, it's any kind of social engineering you can think of in order to get people to do some function they're not supposed to do. So uh, everybody's heard of phishing. Every person who uses a computer now has heard of phishing. And most of the training that we give people um, is boring or it's some slide slideshow that you click through and everybody's like, yeah, 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 fishing, 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 Roger. Um, well, that's not working because uh, people are still extremely susceptible to fishing and we need to come up with a better way to train and engage people in a way that um, actually brings them into the discussion instead of them just clicking through a PowerPoint. Uh, we do that regularly. Uh, I'll go on site and train people um, we do engaging uh, training uh, platforms that will help bring your people in and, and train them in a better way. Um, the second thing that I want to talk about here is managing access rights. So why does, why does ransomware work? Why is it able to do what it does in your environment? Well, really the crux of, of why it works is because people and processes and applications have too many permissions. Um, your users have permissions to, for instance, open PowerShell as administrator. Are they local administrators on their systems? Do they have access to shares and files that they don't need to? Do they have access to ping servers or, or, or touch other equipment that they're not needing to? Specifically right now, um, and I kind of want, we'll, we'll talk about VPNs and, and such here in just a minute, but specifically if, if you know, you've had to create an emergency situation where you've got to add everybody to your remote access policy and, and, and active directory and you just kind of had to throw everybody in there to make your business run. I understand that's, you just kind of have to do what you have to do. However, 
you know, if you've done that and you really haven't thought through the permissions that people have, well, now they're at home uh, and they're doing the same thing and have the same permissions they did there. And if they're VPNing into your environment and there's no segregation, there's no permissions change there, you have a pretty drastic increase in your, uh, your attack surface area. Um, and in that case, if people have too many permissions, um, you know, generally, let's say you click on uh, a ransomware uh, document and it downloads and, and executes, it's, it's probably going to execute originally, you know, before it performs any kind of privilege escalation with the credentials and the permissions that the user that opened it has. So in that case, um, it, the user, the system, it's going to use those permissions, whatever it's, whatever it's able to do. So, you know, network segmentation, user entitlement, um, privilege management, things like that are drastically important. We have to make sure that permissions are where they need to be. And that's, that's, a, that's a general um, principle in security. It's the principle of least privilege. You only get, you only have access to do what you absolutely need in order to do your job. Um, the, the last thing we've got here is patching and, and backup data. Um, so patching patching's the other key there. Um, you know, so again, we use the WannaCry example. Um, that vulnerability came out in March of 2017. Windows publishes a patch, I believe, two weeks later. That's MS17010. I'll never forget that one because it came up so hard. Um, and the patch was free. Obviously, it's published by Windows. And then two months later, the WannaCry outbreak occurs, and it spreads all over the world, uh, bringing down international corporations, billions and billions of dollars, um, just from that one ransomware incident. And that patch was free. It was already published by Windows. Um, that's, a, that's a huge key there. I can't, I can't stress that you need to patch and you need to have a mature patching process that's meeting all of that, uh, that's keeping up with things, that is making sure patches are installed correctly and they're installed everywhere. Um, because, you know, as a hacker, I only need one. I, I need one system to be flawed in that case um, or to be missed in your patching schedule in order to make that happen. And then your, you know, your break glass with ransomware is backing up, back up your data. Um, make sure your backups are protected. So if, if you do your backups, they have to be segregated properly. They have to be protected properly so that the backups don't also get hit with the ransomware and get encrypted. Because um, backup is how you recover from ransomware once it's already infected your systems. Um, so they asked me to add a, a piece here uh, to my section because of, of the situation we've got going on right now, specifically to talk about some considerations while you're working at home. And again, uh, if, if you've got questions, write it down, put it in the chat or something, and we can address those at the end of the uh, presentation here. Um, so the first consideration here is, is device uh, updates, and, and that's all the devices. Um, so that means your iPhone or Android phone, that means your Windows or Mac, yes, your Macs can also be infected. Just because it's a Mac does not mean you're, you're safe from malware. That's a very old, uh, uh, you know, fallacy of, of reasoning there, but it's true. Uh, you need to update all those. Um, the other thing there is applications. So you need to update your applications. Um, the, the two most exploited vulnerabilities of 2019 were a... Uh, Let's see, this one, there was a VBS, so Windows VBS script was one, and then the other one was Adobe. Uh, Adobe application was the, the, the most exploited vulnerability in 2019. And, and yes, ransomware can use those. You can find remote code executable that will allow you for system or root uh, permissions from the outside through applications because they're given too many when they install. Um, the, next, the next big consideration here is an exploit-based endpoint protection software. Um, so we, we have several of those. Uh, we, can, we can help you find one if you don't have one, but it needs to be export-based here specifically because um, in this case, if, if you have an antivirus solution, um, it's, it's, it's probably based on the, the old signature-based software as opposed to um, you know, the more updated ones which are exploit-based. So exploit-based is going to look at a process as opposed to a hash that it takes from a file. So, you know, the old signature base would basically take a file, they perform a hash function of that file, and then compare it to known malicious malware. And if it's not uh, on that list, if you change one bit, the entire hash gets thrown off, so it's pretty useless. Um, exploit base is going to look at the process as a whole. So it's going to say, um, uh, it's going to look at every process that's performing. So let's say, uh, you know, uh, word.exe is all of a sudden attempting to open PowerShell. Well, 
why does Microsoft Word need open PowerShell? I'm going to stop that process. I don't care what's going on. So that's what exploit-based things do as opposed to uh, antivirus, like the old school uh, ones there. Uh, device encryption is important as you're thinking about working from home. Um, so that's, you know, we'll talk about VPN and network and trans so security and transit here in a minute, but specifically device encryption is important as well because you have all these people that are going to be using their devices uh, not at work anymore. So you don't have the physical protection of work and the amount of the, the risk of, of people stealing a device is, is higher now. So uh, I've got BitLocker and FileVault here. Um, there's, there's other options as well, um, but those are device level encryption so that your, your, your drive at rest is encrypted. Those are important to know there. Oops. Not sure why I have one. Ali, do I still have control? There we go, I'm not sure why that happened. Okay, it's not letting me go forward. You may have to, there we go. So you can just hit through the rest of those real quick. I'm not sure why that dropped off real quick. Um, so uh, the other things uh, we need to kind of talk about here are organizational and employee considerations for your policies and procedures. So organizations, you, you may have written and you should have written uh, information security policies and procedures and a lot of those have restrictions, um, specifically because you're going to have remote work restrictions, you know, restricting who and who can't work from home, what devices you can and cannot. Uh, consideration there is to write things like uh, exemptions to policy and new policies, because now all of your people have to work from home, you need to make sure that they're not breaking your policies and then come up with new ones that'll take their place in, in this current time. Backups is another big thing here. Uh, how are they backing up work? Is it on their local desktops or is it to some form of, of cloud? So I've got OneDrive and Google Docs here. Don't go out and just do that. Uh, you need to make sure that your organization allows that or how they perform backups to your work that you're doing on your computers at home. Um, maintaining compliance is still important here. It's kind of unclear as to uh, if people are going to get maybe some, uh, you know, s relief from some of the requirements. But specifically, if you have anything to maintain compliance, you got to be very careful that you don't just break compliance metrics. Um, other thing here for employee considerations. Are your family members using your device? Uh, you know, if you work in the financial or legal districts, or if you work in healthcare, there's lots of different cases here where um, very sensitive data can be on your system that you're using. And you got to make sure that uh, you don't have people that aren't supposed to be using your system using that while you're at home. Um, don't do personal stuff on your work computer specifically while you're connected VPN into your, uh, your, your company. Um, so you really kind of need to segregate your personal and private um, uh, stuff here to make sure that you're not doing those at the same time. Um, sensitive information at home, same, same kind of consideration. Again, if you're working in the legal or healthcare or financial districts, you know, if you've got information you're processing or, you know, printing something or something like that, you got to make sure that you're not breaking policies at home. Let's see if I can take back over here. All right, let's try again. Okay. All right, it's it's going crazy on me again, Ali. We'll just have you. Uh, we'll just have you click through that. Okay, um, so on top of device considerations, um, there's also some working from home, uh, so you can go back to, uh, just go back to update all network devices there. Um, so there's some home considerations as well. Go forward. Yep, stop right, the next one. Yep, okay, so considerations for your home network. Um, so you're probably using your own router right? Um, so you're probably using your home network with your router, uh, with, with your networking devices. All of those come from the factory with default passwords, 
they come with uh, that, you know, you have to update those things. So things to think of there on top of updating your device, you also have to update your router, your net, your, your home networking information. Um, so there are exploits that exist out there for home routers. Um, we maintain a password list of all as many default uh, router passwords and usernames as possible. Um, because that's one way to crack those things. Using default passwords is, is uh, a danger there. So you need to get into your systems at home and make sure that you're updating your router and your networking uh, information. And then also, uh, you know, using proper security, you know, using a WPA2. Um, you know, well, why do I need to worry about that at home? Well, it's because I live next door. Um, there's, there's people like me that, you know, they're, they're all over the place. It's pretty easy to figure out a lot of these things um, you know, it's, it's easy to figure out how to do some wireless cracking. It's easy to do. Um, so and I'll kind of go over what kind of attack vectors are out there, but you know, yes, you do need to worry about this at your home network because, uh, all of us, it's, 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 you might live next to a hacker and you have no idea, or you might have one in your own house. Who knows? <laughs> Pretty easy to get, figure out some of this stuff. Um, so use WPA2, um, you, at least on your, your wireless security, change your passwords. Yes. You still need to be using a VPN. Um, and we'll talk about some of that kind of stuff here. If you have a work VPN, use, use, their, use their VPN for work. Um, if you don't have one that's provided at work, you should look into doing one for yourself uh, as a home VPN. And we kind of already talked about networking devices. So you can move forward a little bit there, Ali. So let's talk about some common attack vectors. This is just a basic one that I could find. Um, an iframe is a, a pretty old school technique, but it's still in common use. Um, so an iframe is basically a, a, a window, if you will, uh, that an attacker can use. So oftentimes you can change, uh, and that's, that's not a great one there, so you can move on to the next one. But what you can see there is uh, basically you can create an iframe that will change the URL. So the URL will be different, but the website itself um, will not be what you're actually going to. So, you know, the, the original example was Google where you can see the Google website, and it is a view into the Google website, but if you check out the URL, it's actually different. Um, and that's a common technique for attackers to use in order for you to get a drive-by download or, or find a malicious website. Uh, another thing here is a, uh, you know, and that's from lookalike domains, you have man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, basically, uh, you know, one of the reasons you do need to still be using a VPN, especially if you're using like a, uh, a network, a guest network, or something at a hotel or home or at, you know, a coffee shop, even though most of them are closed right now, um, is a man in the middle attack. Um, and just because you see that little uh, encryption icon in your, your browser does not mean you're always encrypted. Uh, it could just mean you're encrypted with the bad guy. Um, so j j that can be a false sense of security. Um, and it's pretty easy to set up those attacks, specifically if an attacker can either take over the network uh, at the, the local place or the hotspot or something like that, or create an evil twin network, which is one that looks just like it, it's just stronger. So a common attack technique here would be, um, and I know Starbucks is closed, so this is a bad example, but you go to Starbucks and you see their, their free network, and then you see two of them that have the exact same name, and one of them is much stronger than the other one, and it's much both, so I'm gonna definitely get on that network. Uh, well. A common attack technique would just be for people like me to go sit in Starbucks, create a, a evil network that basically serves as a man in the middle attack um, that's better than Starbucks. And then you're going to obviously get on my network and I'm going to see everybody your, your data. Um, so you can move forward there, Ali. Uh, password vaulting. This is another, this is another key for you as an individual. Um, as a corporation, you can look into this um, as, as a pretty quick way, you know, so it's kind of hard to, adopt multi-factor authentication wholesale quickly. That's a, that's a difficult thing to do. If you can't do something like that, you should look into password vaulting. Um, there are free and cheap ones out there. Uh, LastPass is a great one. Um, we've used it many, many times. We can help you with that setting up. And if, if your organization doesn't do that, you should look at doing this as an individual as well. Um, you can set up free multi-factor authentication in front of LastPass so you get in there. It'll automatically fill your passwords for you. It'll generate passwords for you. Um, and, and this is really key here because using the same password across uh, platforms is one of the ways that's it's one of the easiest ways that we can get in. Um, because, you know, you use the same password for Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn that you use for work. If you use the exact same password there and we find that over 70% of people do, um, then it's, it's very easy for us to jump from one to another. So it's important to have some way to keep your passwords different and stored in a secure fashion. 
Uh, and that's a great way to do it. You can move forward, Ali. Um, so I wanted to talk about some, you know, we kind of hit on this already. Uh, false sense of security. Yes, you need encryption. You need device encryption and you need encryption in transit, which is going to be your VPN. But don't take that as a false sense of security. Oh, I've got a VPN. Oh, I've got device encryption. I'm good to go. Um, not true. Uh, there's, there's still many other things like we've already talked about that can leave you exposed. So don't just assume that because we have a VPN or because I have device encryption that I'm good. Um, uh, what other attack vectors do we really need to think about at this time? Phishing is going to increase. Uh, everybody knows that everybody's working at home and they're trying to, they're, everybody, everyone is now on their computers. Um, so it's, again, it's a hacker's paradise right now. Um, so things to think about with uh, phishing. So specifically here, I just listed a couple things there for the IT people in there. Um, uh, sender policy framework, uh, DKIM, uh, which is domain keys, something I don't remember the acronym here. Um, these are things that you can turn on on your system. DMARC is a combination of SPF and DKIM. Those are some things that you can implement um, to kind of catch some of those top level phishing things. Those are some things you can implement there. Uh, we can help with that if, if you're interested. Um, other things to think about with phishing, and this is just for everyone, uh, power influence, these are the things that you're gonna see the most of. Um, so it's very easy to set up either a lookalike domain or something that looks extremely similar to yours where you've got the CEO, and you can see that here in this, where the CEO is asking someone to perform an action, um, hey, I, I, please do this for me and I need them ASAP. And I'm the CEO, so you're gonna do it because I asked you to do it. Um, so things like power, influence, urgency, all of those things are definitely something you really have to watch for um, at this time because you know, you, you've kind of lost that human-to-human -human interaction. Um, so we kind of talked about uh, phishing already. Um, we talked about urgency, favors, recent success. So I just kind of wanted to mention when I dropped off, you know, we've had some uh, recent phishing attacks that we've performed. Uh, the user was in the office with the person that we were imitating and they were able to walk over and ask them a strange question about our request. Specifically in these cases, we were asking for W-2s, we were asking for invoices and things like that. Um, and uh, the only reason we failed was because they were in the office with the person that we were imitating. So um, now that that is gone, um, had we performed this test three weeks later, we probably would have succeeded with um, pretty devastating results um, in that case. So that's a very important thing to understand here as that's going on. Another piece to note um, that, that will probably end because everybody is remote now is vishing. Um, so vishing is voice phishing. Um, and just because you think you know somebody on the other end of the phone does not mean that they are actually who they are. Um, so you would be shocked at the amount of information that I can pull um, from things like social media, from things like uh, uh, the different websites that you have, from different, uh, from the dark web, from other kind of sources about information about, um, you know, things, your, how your business operates, the kind of words that you would use when talking to someone else. So be aware that vishing is probably going to be an increase. Another interesting statistic is that a lot of these work and have much more effectiveness on Fridays. Um, so other things to think about is things like, you know, we know that. We know that you're more likely to capitulate to one of our requests on a Friday because you're more likely to be successful. Um, so that's just things to think about when you're, when we're going through this. Other things is uh, IoT devices. You know, you really need to update everything. Uh, we've used we've used printers, we've used uh, uh, smart boards, we've used routers, we've used uh, anything to get into your network. So if a device update's available, you need to do it. Um, you need to make sure that all your devices are updated. And and you know the note here that we will kind of talk about is is ransomware is going to keep keep happening. Um, as you guys and as we and as everybody is more dependent on their computers to operate their business, this is going to increase. Uh, and you need to be prepared to, um, to deal with this as it, as it comes along. And, and we can help with that in, in every facet. Um, with that, um, I will hand this back over. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you to, uh, to Jeff and to Jonathan. And I want to thank Lockstep um, for inviting uh, me and, uh, and trusted counsel participate. Um, I always learn a lot from these guys. Uh, it's exciting to be 
little scary, but it's exciting to be in an area like this that is uh, constantly changing and presenting new challenges. I just only wish that we had been able to do this in person, but uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get there eventually. Um, and again, I, I apologize for the bad lawyer humor. Stick them up. You've probably played some version of that. Um, reminds me of when uh, cloud computing first started to become all the rage and you had all these corny, is it raining where you are, protecting your data in the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. So we work with what we have. Uh, anyway, so next slide, please. There we go. So um, despite your best efforts and uh, what Jonathan has walked you through, let's say that, um, again, despite everything you've done to try to protect yourself, you get hit uh, by a ransomware attack. Now what? Um, well, first of all, don't panic. Um, easier said than done because things are coming at you mighty fast. Um, your business, you know, has a gun to its head. So it's really important that you have a plan uh, and that you work your plan. Um, and so um, that means that if you don't have a plan currently, um, or if you have one and you haven't looked at it in a while, you need to take action now. Um, you need to engage your internal stakeholders, um, trusted outside partners, subject matter experts like um, Smith and Howard, Lockstep, and dare I say a trusted counsel, to ask the right questions and identify gaps and weaknesses um, in your plan and develop one that actually fits your business. Um, you know, suffice to say, if the first time you're thinking about your plan is after you've been attacked, it's probably too late. So um, act now. Um, as I said, subject matter experts can help you. Um, there are a number of standard setting bodies as well, ISO, uh, NIST, and others that can, um, can provide at least templates for best practices and benchmarks and guidelines. Um, and again, we've talked about the importance of, of being able to move in a hurry because um, every minute that your operation is paralyzed, that you're essentially down, um, that much more money is out the door um, and, uh, and uh, time is of the essence. Um, so the second point we'll talk about, we'll get more to this later, is the importance of working with legal counsel, whether you're lucky enough to have someone on staff or if you need to reach out to folks like me. Um, if there has been an attack, there are certain compliance obligations that you have, legal and regulatory requirements in terms of notification. Who do you notify? How long do you have to notify? What does the notification look like, et cetera? You really do need to work with legal counsel to determine this, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, this also includes um, keeping your internal and external stakeholders abreast. So everybody from senior management to your board to your internal subject matter experts and any outside advisors um, uh, that you may have. And again, you're gonna hear a lot of, I, I tend to repeat myself, but don't delay, plan ahead. It's really important to have a plan uh, in place. So time is of the essence. Next slide. Um, I want to talk for a minute. This often gets overlooked, uh, but it's something that is uh, attracting increasing attention um, and, and, and is really, really important. And it has to do with board responsibility for cyber risk. Um, as uh, you know, both Jeff and Jonathan have pointed out, um, cybersecurity is a business problem. It's not something that can just be left to um, the CISO or your technologists or to your lawyers, it is actually uh, bottom line impacting and there are real dollars and cents involved. Um, so it's important that the board understands this and has folks uh, that can translate some of this um, sometimes hyper-technical jargon, whether it's on the technology side or even on the legal side, can translate it into terms that they can understand. Because uh, a lot of boards, most boards that I'm 
familiar with don't have the kind of um, uh, expertise in this area um, to be able to do this without translation. So it's important to uh, be able to convey this message in terms that they can understand. Board members um, have a what's called a fiduciary duty to the company shareholders and to investors to actively oversee the measures that are used to protect sensitive data and customer information. Um, that means that board members can be held personally liable um, if there's a failure of oversight, um, if there's been a complete and systemic failure in ensuring that cybersecurity risks have been appropriately managed. So they need to really understand that um, and be able uh, to take meaningful action to, to mitigate these risks. And, you know, as we, um, you know, as we were talking about, you know, how this is really a business problem, you know, one of the things that is kind of important, how to say it, pre-work is to, you know, start out by identifying the information within your business that would be of value to cyber criminals. Um, it's important to have a complete and thoughtful data inventory uh, to be able to sort of um, figure out what is important and how to manage risk. Uh, it's really important to know where your data is, um, what the nature of the data is, um, and, and, and be able to sort of assign um, a risk profile to that data. Um, and so obviously customer data, commercially sensitive information, trade secrets, things like that, are high value targets for cyber criminals. Um, board members themselves and senior management are high value targets for um, cyber criminals. Um, they can be um, increasingly the, um, the uh, object of blackmail, uh, extortion. Um, you'll sometimes hear the term spear phishing, which is a very targeted attack um, going after um, someone who's either on the board or is a senior management, uh, uh, you know, somebody very high up in your company. You know, it's basically a bad actor that is um, uh, tempting and tricking uh, that person to do something um, foolish. Um, so, as I said, it's important for the board to take action to mitigate cybersecurity risks. These can include things like employing a chief information security officer, a CISO, to help understand and identify cybersecurity risks um, and how those risks might affect the company at large. Uh, if the board is big enough and, and maybe has some expertise to establish a risk oversight committee within the board to oversee these types of activities, um, and, you know, if there's not uh, enough, um, if, there, if there aren't the resources um, in-house to do this job, and there often aren't, um, work with, uh, uh, you know, identify and work with a trusted third party, a Smith & Howard, a lockstep, a trusted counsel that can provide you with the necessary expertise um, and resources to, to bridge um, any internal gaps. Um, so, as I said, um, at the risk of repeating myself, it's important to have a plan. It should be in writing. Um, so these, you shouldn't just be winging this when this happens. Uh, it should, at a minimum, this plan should include each team member's role and responsibility um, and, and how the company will actually report breaches. And we'll get more to that in a minute to investors, the public, other stakeholders, including regulators, and what the timing for that is. And um, this often also gets overlooked. Um, as important as it, as it is to have a plan, you need to have regular reporting on and testing of the plan. So board members in particular should receive regular reports from uh, the information security team, um, the CISO, if there is one, about the company's cybersecurity risks, um, what the company is doing to address them, and the company's overall health. Uh, and readiness to uh, respond to an incident. Um, these should be at a minimum uh, on an annual basis. I think best practice is probably more on a quarterly basis, given how quickly the threats are changing. Um, uh, but in any event, there does need to be a process in place for um, ongoing uh, reporting. Um, so yeah, notification. So this is um, the reason that really you need to involve legal counsel uh, right away when there is an incident is because 
Uh, we don't have, as many of you may know, a single overarching federal breach notification law or regulation. Um, so it, it becomes potentially a 50 state exercise uh, along with, um, depending on um, what industry you're in, some federal overlay. So if you are, for example, in the healthcare uh, area, there are um, HIPAA regulations that you need to pay attention to. So you're talking about the Department of Health and Human Services. If you're a financial services company, you have even more of a patchwork uh, quilt of potential regulators ranging from the Office of the Controller of the Currency to the Consumer Financial Protection Board, um, sorry, Bureau, um, CFPB, I'm used to the acronym. So um, it really does require um, a lot of guidance to be able to understand exactly what your obligations are. Um, in order for your legal counsel to actually help you navigate this minefield, you need to, um, to gather the facts and be prepared to tell your legal counsel um, the, the facts as you know them, understanding that they will change. So that's why it's really important to activate your plan and start talking to all of your internal stakeholders uh, about what, what is known about the incident. And then legal counsel will have the information that, that he or she needs under attorney-client privilege um, to uh, begin to uh, work out what the time frame means, needs the time frames because unfortunately there's not just one because different states have different requirements. Um, who do you have to notify? What does the notification need to look at look like? Um, and what are your, um, um, as I said, what are your deadlines? Um, and um, the other thing you should also think about, depending on um, the scope of the incident, is working out a communications plan. Um, either using internal stakeholders or perhaps depending on the scope and nature, even engaging an outside PR firm, crisis management firm to help you um, do that. Um, and um, then send the notifications um, and uh, do whatever you can, obviously, to mitigate the effects of the breach. Immediately implement whatever technical measures you can to stop any further data loss. Um, uh, look at your contracts. Um, if the attack is because uh, one of your third parties perhaps hasn't done what it should have done, there may be indemnification obligations. Talk to your insurance broker, assuming that you have insurance coverage. Um, hopefully you do. Um, cyber uh, coverage is not cheap. Uh, partially because, as Jonathan uh, said, and to some extent Jeff, uh, ransomware attacks are increasing and they are succeeding. People are actually paying, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So that coverage is not, um, is not unfortunately, not, not, uh, not cheap. Um, and document everything. Make sure that everything that you do once you've activated your plan um, is, is written down somewhere. This will be important whether uh, a regulator comes knocking um, for board oversight purposes. God forbid if you should enter into litigation, you want to be able to have that um, audit trail, if you will, of uh, what you did and when. Um, and then finally, uh, once the dust is settled, have an after action plan. Look at what happened, what went right, what went wrong, and revise your plan accordingly. Next slide. So, um, and this is something where, you know, others may have some view here. This is kind of the, uh, I would say the $64,000 question, but it might be more like the $64 million question or somewhere in between, is whether you actually pay. Um, you get hit, your ransom is demanded. Is it, is it a good idea to actually pay the ransom? And you'll hear a lot of different answers to this. Um, to just take a recent example, the city of Atlanta, as many of you locals know, uh, was hit back in 2018, and I believe that the ransom demanded was 52 grand in Bitcoin. Um, the city, um, I think probably following the advice of uh, law enforcement, um, decided not to pay the ransom, and um, a conservative estimate is that it has cost them about $17 million to fix the damage to the extent that they've actually been able to fix everything. Uh, the city of Baltimore as well was recently hit. It didn't pay the ransom and it's still working on fixing the problem. 
So um, there's certainly nothing illegal about paying the ransom. And uh, traditionally, until fairly recently, the advice from law enforcement was don't pay it because you're just encouraging uh, further criminal activity. Um, I think their advice has recently become a bit more nuanced, which is, okay, it's easy to say that. And we understand why law enforcement would want to encourage criminal behavior. But, you know, if you have a business that has effectively been shut down and the clock is ticking and you're losing more and more money every day, um, you know, whether it's potential fines, loss of reputation, uh, litigation, uh, you know, class action lawsuits, there are all kinds of horrible things that could happen. It's easy to say, don't pay the ransom. Um, so I think the more recent guidance has been, you know, again, get senior management involved, get legal counsel involved, get the board involved, and weigh what are the risks um, of not paying versus paying. Um, and the latest data we've seen is that about 50% pay and 50% don't. It's hard to know because, as I believe Jonathan said, we don't even know, we don't even have a full picture because a lot of folks don't even report. So, um, you know, and there's always a chance that you do pay and um, they still don't release your data. Um, I've seen a recent study that says that happens about 30% of the time for those that actually pay. Um, they demand something else or they just, you can't get it all back in any event. So I wish I could be more reassuring. I think the key is, uh, the hope is that it never happens at all. So do whatever you can. If you can knock out 80% of the risk, according to Jonathan, then why wouldn't you do it? Um, you know, I understand, you know, it's not uh, this kind of stuff. Compliance stuff isn't sexy. It doesn't drive, you know, it's not as fun as sales, but it's a hell of a lot more fun than getting hit with, um, with fines and, you know, losing your reputation and, uh, and, and like losing your business. This is real stuff. I mean, if you're shut down, you know, and can't resume um, your business in anything like the fashion that you did before, you may have to shut down. Um, and so it's, it's real. Next slide. Hello? Yep. So ways that we can limit liability, and I know we're running out of time, yeah. Um, so uh, just, Know who you're doing business with in terms of vendor management. Have good agreements in place with them. Work with legal counsel to make sure that that's the case, that you're appropriately protected. You can do everything. You can keep your side of the street clean until the cows come home. How's that for two metaphors blended together? <laughs> um, and you could still uh, you know, face uh, an incident, um, an attack, because one of your counterparties didn't do what they were supposed to do. So it helps to have good contracts in place. Talk to your broker if you haven't already and look at cyber coverage, find out how much it costs, look at the, the options that are available to you, revisit that on a periodic basis. A second bullet, periodically review, update and test your plan. Your people are your weakest link, right? As we've said before, lovely, funny cartoon uh, on the slide. You can have the best tools, all the latest and greatest, and have one doofus that clicks on a bad link uh, or does something dumb, and all of that goes out the window. So it's really important to do everything you can to educate and train your personnel and realize that it's not one and done. You have to rinse and repeat. Next slide. This is just wrapping up. These are just some practical pointers. Um, Dust off your contracts, make sure that terms and conditions are concise and easy to understand. Limitation of liability, more than I, I don't have time to get into it now, but it's a way you can allocate the risk contractually so that your liability is not uncapped um, if somebody else screws up. Um, keep all your technology current, we talked about patching, have the plan ready and up to date, train your personnel, have the uh, affected stakeholders ready uh, when you need to activate, activate the plan. And the last plug for me, have your legal counsel on speed dial because you will need some help uh, if this actually happens. And we're here to help. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, now we go to Derek and Neil. Are you guys on? Hey, good morning, everybody. 
Morning. Morning. So um, we had some slides to go along with this. Uh, we'll email the slides to all the participants as well. I saw a question come in. Um, so I'll give them a couple minutes to just get the slides up and running. And while we're waiting for that, I just want to thank the Lockstep team and everyone that's presented today, as well as any, everybody listening, um, for having me and the opportunity to speak. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, Pro Towels was, went through a really trying time this past July, and we refer to all of our contractors not necessarily as partners, but more as family, and Lockstep has really become part of that Pro Towels family, so I'm happy to do this, happy to be part of the team, and happy to help out any way I can. So they're still having power problems at the office, Derek, so why don't you guys go ahead um, and, um, and just assume that the slides are coming in a second here. No problem. So a little bit of background on ProTals and Lockstep's relationship. Um, previously, we did not work with ProTals before their ransomware incident. They um, were referred to us through a, another MSP that did not have the security expertise um, and one of our partners in South Carolina. Um, from that point, we started working with them and, and realized that they got one of the uh, forms of ransomware called Ryuk. The Ryuk ransomware is a non-persistent uh, ransomware, meaning once it runs in memory, uh, you don't have to be worried about it coming back unless you get reinfected. Um, and, and this ransomware happened actually on a holiday. So it was July 3rd, where everybody's home, we weren't, they weren't monitoring the systems, and they come in on the Tuesday, because if you guys remember, July 4th was on a, uh, fell on a Monday, and then Tuesday they came in, and their whole system had, had been brought to a stop. Um, the ransomware had propagated across all of the sites. Um, so ProTals um, had made some acquisitions over the last three years, and they grew to be about six locations um, and, and three different companies that were formed under the ProTal family. Uh, so the, the ransomware had spread throughout their whole environment um, from West Coast all the way to the East Coast, and this all populated through um, VPNs. So they had a, a set of VPNs that all uh, can collapse back down to AWS and all of their main applications were hosted in there. Um, so from that point, we, we kind of started trying to realize what the, the scope of the ransomware was and, and how to best solve it. Um, we, they had an IT director and you know they communicated directly with the ransomware uh, individuals and they actually were given a pretty small um, ransom it was about 10 bitcoins and I'm sorry guys, Joshua is, is going crazy. Wor working from home is a, is a whole new new experience. Um, but from that point, we, um, we went ahead and, and decided to pay the ransom. Uh, of, throughout the course of a week, it took us to mitigate everything. We worked to rebuild all the systems and um, you know, through that point, we kind of tried to migrate from, from AWS into the Lockstep data center. And then Neil, if you can kind of talk about the, the business case behind you know, how it affected the systems and getting everything back up. Sure, um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Excellent, awesome. Um, yeah, so we, like, like Derek spoke, we, we were um, hit with the Ryuk uh, ransomware over the holiday weekend in July. Um, it took us about three weeks, um, and Lockstep was not really engaged at the beginning, but it took us about three weeks to get everything back up and running. Now, it did not fully affect our um, business overall because we used to be a pen and paper type of industry, so a lot of our production facilities, a lot of our work, a lot of our employees understood those um, previous 
I guess, directives on how to run the business in a pen and paper environment. Um, we were very fortunate in that way. I know a lot of businesses out there don't have that luxury as they've gone so digital and so automated that if their systems were brought down, they would be in a much harder spot than where ProTowels was um, after our attack. Um, you know, since then we've engaged Lockstep. Um, we're putting in place uh, everything everyone talked about here, VPNs, advanced firewalls, um, trainings. I think as one of the other slides mentioned as well, training users tends to be the hardest thing to do. Um, I used to work in IT at a hospital where the majority of my um, clients, if you would, would be doctors and just getting them to comply with the technology and the requirements of um, resetting their passwords on a regular basis and not using the same passwords was a very difficult task. Um, the human error, as was mentioned, is a huge problem. And then, of course, verifying to make sure you're not part of a phishing or someone who's impersonating someone it is, is a real challenge to business. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of training to get people to understand that. Even, even the highly educated doctors that you think would understand, they just, it's, it's difficult to get people to break habits and, and comply. From your perspective, Neil, what did you think that Lockstep brought to the table that was unique in the situation that helped you guys really recover and, and move forward? Um, Hands-on expertise. Um, I know, again, dealing with previous consultants and previous um, IT companies, having the ability to have not only people on site, but have people that have the knowledge. A lot of people claim to have the knowledge and claim to understand things, but to actually have the firsthand knowledge and understand all the nuances, especially in a business like ours, where a lot of our systems are customized, a lot of our systems are proprietary, but having the, the intellect to understand you know, the back end of a, a certain machine and how overall that was going to operate after it was brought back up was a huge help. Um, a lot of companies out there just don't have that ability and that, that critical thinking skill. They know they're one silo and that's it. And where Lockstep understood a lot more of our business and the business that was required and the systems that are required to run our business than other consultants I've dealt with in the past. Yeah, in lockstep, like I said, guys, we've previously never worked with Pro Towels. You know, we came in over the course of six months and learned their systems, learned you know their business procedures, and you know by the time that we were done, we had a documented process for uh, the SQL servers, the applications that run the manufacturing business, and a, a lot of what occurred, we didn't have any documentation. I mean, there's nights that me and Neil stayed on the phone just trying to comb through um, the previous director's emails and uh, going, you know, Ken was involved with it. Ken was on site in Abbeville going through offices just to find that documentation. So uh, a lot of this was unknown to us as we went through that process. And then from that side, um, Neil was heavily involved with their CEO, Kevin Nord. Uh, Kevin has been hands-on through this whole process. So one of the things that I wanted to talk to you guys about is when this occurs, it's not an IT problem. It becomes a business problem. And having somebody at the helm of the business to be able to say, okay, we're going to throw whatever resources that we need to do to get us back operational and also to rebuild. So Neil, if you can kind of talk about Kevin and, and how he handled himself in the back office and taking you guys from where you were and trying to put you guys back into the right place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think our entire leadership team, you know, understood that, you know, under the previous IT director, things had to change and taking direction from the lockstep team, again, with the firewalls and updating um, switches and updating Wi-Fi networks and, you know, replacing servers that, you know, were old enough to get their driver's license. Um, those things had to occur, and it was important that they occurred um, timely 
but efficiently and cost effectively as well, not over purchasing in anticipation of what we'll need 10 years down the road, but anticipating what's currently needed now and not band-aiding up an existing system. Um, what about working with legal and, and working the, you know, you guys had cyber insurance, so you guys were able to get reimbursed for some of the services and loss of business. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, I mean, overall, that was more um, Kevin than, than myself, but um, locked up help throughout the, that process as well, you know, making sure we crossed our T's and dotted our I's so that any opportunities that were there um, both from a legal perspective or from an insurance perspective were, were done correctly. I, a lot of that paperwork, again, not, it's not something anybody ever wants to go through and it's not something that anybody ever prepares to go through. But when your insurance company throws a packet of paper with a bunch of terms on it and says, fill this out, it's good to know that you have a partner um, in your, on your side to help fill out that information. Um, you know, it did take some time. It, it did go back and forth um, to get all the documentation together. But o overall, it, it was a it was a seam it, it was a seamless process. It just took a little. It just took time to make sure that everything was crossed and dotted. And then Charlie's going to jump in so that we can open this up to questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Neil and Derek. We appreciate it. So that finishes our, um, so our overall presentation. We're at the bottom of the hour, and we really appreciate your, um, your time and attention. Apologize for the technical issues around losing power. Um, so um, just as a last note here, we have a service called Lockstep Protect that we basically have parts of this where we can help you mitigate your ransomware risk with these services. And there are different things here um that we provide we have different packages you know jonathan will tell you that the essential package will take care of about 90 percent of the risk there and then we have more plus and holistic that gets you even more response so you know our package includes training uh it includes um, vulnerability management um and then it also includes entitlement management and data insurance we'll be glad to talk about any of these I did want to give a second. Are there any questions? I think uh, Ali that we need to raise our hands or chat, or can they can they call out questions? If you can ask questions, raise your hand. We can just give you access to one at a time. Okay. Any questions? Okay, well, I don't see any questions coming up. We'll be glad to uh, answer any individually. Again, we thank you for everybody's time. Uh, we'll be having another one of these in the next few weeks around the remote uh, work from home. Um, so thank you again. And uh, we appreciate it if you guys would fill out a survey so we can learn how to continue to do these better. You'll be receiving a survey, I guess, via email. So we appreciate your time. Uh, do we have a message? Do we have a Thanks. question out here? Uh, can we confirm the video will be available? Uh, I know that the presentation will be available. Ali, about the video? Yes, the entire presentation will be available on video. Um, video and the slides will be sent uh, after, the, but after today. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. We appreciate your time. Have a good day. Uh, again, thanks for participating.